Is your name written there? Amen. Uh, no, it's a blessing that we can sing. If we know, if we know the Saviour, yes, my name's written there. And it gives us great comfort and great yeah, glory to our soul, blessing to our soul, if we know the Lord is our Saviour. And if he is uh, the author and finisher of our faith, because we know him, a blessing. Well, we've been going through just some of the things in the constitution of this church and uh, I know that that can get a little bit dry and uh, we've only just started. But uh, we've been looking at church membership and the church and uh, we asked ourselves, why should we become a member of a church or does the Bible really talk about church membership? And we looked at that uh, and did the early church have church membership and we looked at those questions. But how do we function as a church? Uh, we've said that the church is a calling out of, of people to a meeting place. And, uh, you know, we said that there is the uh, body of, of Christ, the whole body of Christ, and every person who is a believer uh, will be or is part of that church and uh, will be called out at some time and they will be uh, with the Lord and uh, will be in heaven. What a blessing that will be. And we'll sing a new song. Worthy is the Lamb. And we'll sing plenty of songs, I think, up there. Uh, and uh, we'll be singing that chorus, Yes, My Name's Written There. There'll be no question about it. Amen. Uh, there's no question now if we know the Word of God properly and uh, we've trusted in Christ. There's no question. Our name's written there. And so what a blessing that is. And we looked at the fact that there is a local church and it's made up of born-again believers or should be, uh, those that have been baptised and uh, called out of the world to gather together. And uh, we, we realise that that's an important process and uh, it's good that we are here. Amen that we are gathered together. We're called out of the world to fellowship and to worship and to uh, sing praises unto God together and fellowship together and just rejoice. And we'll get to that in a minute because that's one of the purposes and one of the functions. But we said that when we come together, there was a careful acceptance in the early church. And we said that in Acts chapter 20 and verse 29 that Paul warned the Ephesian elders, warning, there are grievous wolves that will enter in among you. And we need to be careful. Why? Because they don't want to spare the flock. They want to devour the flock. They want to spread the flock. They want to scatter the flock. Peter said in 2 Peter 2, 1, he said there will be false uh, prophets that will come among the people and false teachers that are among you already. We need to be warned about these things. And that is why Paul warned Timothy uh, to lay hands on no man suddenly. They take your time, see what they talk about, see what, how they act and then bring them in. And so these were important things, careful acceptance. And then we said people can come in and they can have a, a letter of commendation and that from another church had been members there. But that doesn't necessarily in our church that we welcome you straight in. We like to see, lay hands on no man suddenly and like to see and, and work with you and, and talk with you and uh, because... We want to be uh, a church that stands. So there's a careful acceptance, a letter of commendation or commendation letter. And we said last time that it was also a command to obey. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves uh, for the watch of the flock. That doesn't mean that pastors and elders and deacons lord it over people. That's not what that means. Uh, but as elders and pastors and deacons that we need to be careful and to be watchful and to be helping and to be edifying uh, and you know what the whole church is to be edifying one another in love and that's where we need to be but we also need to carry out our responsibility as part of the body and a part of the church and the first responsibility that we have is Fellowshipping with one another. It's so important to fellowship. Turn with me to the book of Acts. We see the early church gathering together. And in Acts chapter 2 
and verse 42, we see the early church after people just got saved, 3,000 of them, and in verse 42, and they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. It's important that we come together and fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9 says, God is faithful by whom ye are called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, that verse of scripture, it tells us, forsake not the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Especially as you see the day approaching. You see, we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves. Come together. Fellowship together. Spend time together. Because there needs to be connectiv con connectivity. <laughs> I couldn't get my head around, tongue around that word. We need to be connected. You know, our body is connected. You know, at our joints, we have ligaments that hold our joints together. Without ligaments, you damage a ligament, you're in all sorts of trouble, in pain, etc. Right? Because they hold ourselves. We've got tendons that hold our muscles to our bones. So we've got ligaments holding bone to bone. We have tendons that hold muscles to... And then we have connectivity, connectivity uh, between our brain and every part of our body through our nerves. We have our lymphatic system. They're all joint together so that our body can function. Without that connection, our body doesn't function properly. And I believe that this fellowship is basically giving us that connect con connect connecting. Uh, I'm just going to say connecting. All right? We're connecting together and we need to be connected together. All right? Because... Uh, that's what God wants. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 1. Let's turn there in our scriptures, uh, in the word of God. It's good to see it. It's good to read it. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 1. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them in La at Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. You see, Paul was trying to connect in fellowship through the written word there because he's, he's saying that he has uh, a great conflict for them and he wants to see them. In verse 2 he says that their hearts might be comforted being knit together in love and unto all riches of the fullness, uh, full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. We have that connection being knit together. You ladies that knit. Uh, I did learn how to knit when I was a kid, not very well. Uh, I used to do French knitting, you know, with a little cotton, but, uh, old cotton thing and you used to have nails around it and you used to go around and do that. I wouldn't be able to do it now, I don't think, but that's all right. And then mum taught me to knit with, you know, knitting needles and that sort of thing. Uh, but if, the, if it's knit properly, all right, it's joined together. And if it's tied off properly, it's not going to come undone. Okay? That's when it gets a hole in it and that's when it comes apart. It's not holding together. And we need to be holding together as a church. We need to be together. This is so important. And fellowship is where that's at. That's how we connect. That's how we stay together. When there's a problem, when there's a hole, that's when things fall apart. And we don't want that. We want to have good fellowship. We want to have fellowship in love. And in that passage of Scripture in Hebrews chapter 10, the verse before that, said that we provoke one another in love. We can't do that unless we're meeting together. We need to be provoking in love. In love, yeah. What did I say? It's all right. We need to be, it's all right. I thought I said the wrong thing. That's okay. Uh, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 1. Praise God. It's all right. 
Okay. I'll get a rundown when I get home. You said this wrong. It's all right. Hebrews chap- uh, sorry, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 1. If there be, if there, if there therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye might be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and one mind. You see that connecting together of one mind, like-minded, one love. And uh, so important that we get that, that there is that fellowship uh, in the Spirit, being one together. And this is one of the functions of the church and this is what we should be providing and we should be uh, heading towards that fellowship, that great fellowship. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. You see, this fellowship can be broken, unfortunately. And, and this is where we need to, to realise that. Verse 7. Now let's back up to verse 5. This then, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. You see that? If we are in sin, if we're walking in darkness, then we can't have fellowship with God and it will break down the fellowship between us. Remember we talked about that hole and a, and a woolen garment knit together? That's what happened. Someone can, needs to come along and darn that hole. Stitch it together. Make it right. Mend it together. God can do that. And that's where it says in verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we can renew that fellowship. We need to say sorry if we wrong somebody. But you know what? Sometimes we don't even know that we've wronged somebody. Sometimes we need to be told. And if we are told, then we need to do something about it. And that's important. We need to keep that connection between each other in fellowship, keep that fellowship open and so that we can walk in the light and have fellowship with Jesus Christ and have fellowship with one another. That's what it's all about. The second functioning of the church is that the church is there for spiritual nurture and edification of believers through the teaching of God's word, the Bible. When from this pulpit we have worldly stories that have a spiritual meaning and we're not looking in the Bible ever, please, that's a warning. We need to be preaching from God's word. That is the authority. And so that is where we need to get our foundation from. And the Apostle Paul taught that in many places. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. Ephesians chapter 4. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Ephesians chapter 4. And starting in verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. 
but speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, making, maketh increase of the body under the edifying of itself in love. You see, we need to be building one another up. Yes, the pastors, the elders, the, the, the deacons uh, have a responsibility, the teachers have a responsibility of presenting God's word. You know what? But it's good to talk about it after the service, when we're together, sharing maybe what we've learnt from the Bible. That's, that's all good. We need to be doing that because what does it say? From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies. We should all be a blessing to each other in the word. Did I tell you what I read today in the word of God? This is the important thing. The word of God teaching one another, encouraging one another. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11. Have no fellowship with the unruly works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Seeing then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And so we see there that we need to be in the light. We need to be in the truth. All things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. God's word is light. God is light. And so we need to be in the light. We need to be in uh, the truth, the truth of God's word. Verses 22. No, that's not where I'm at. Okay, let's, I'm in Ephesians, not in Galatians. You know that. Let's turn back to Galatians. I hope you were confused. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13. The tip for me was, the next verse was the wives submit yourselves to your husbands. And I've gone, no, that's not right. Uh, I've, I've made a mistake there. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13. Sorry about that, brethren. For brethren, ye have been called to liberty, only use not liberty for occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. You see, we need to be in the word, in love, being a blessing to one another. Verse 22 talks about those fruits of the spirit that we will have as we edify one another and encourage one another and walk in the spirit. Girls have learnt this verse, is that right? Okay. 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. God wants us to encourage each other to get these spiritual gifts as we look into the Word. Edifying one another in love. And then there is true scriptural worship. The Hebrew word, the Old Testament word, means to depress. This is for worship. Prostrate. That means to get down and bow ourselves in homage to, to God. That's what worship is. 
and our hearts need to be bowed before God if we're going to worship. And we need to come together and bow ourselves together as it were. You know, I remember growing up in a church and we had kneeling pads in the front so that we would get down at certain times and we would kneel before God. We need to do that in our hearts at least, to bow before God and humbly come before Him. The first use of the word in the book of Genesis, this Old Testament one, is found in Genesis chapter 22 and verse 5. Genesis chapter 22 and verse 5. And it says, And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Do you remember the story behind this? This is when Abraham was going to take Isaac and he built an altar and he put the wood that the lad was carrying on and Isaac had already asked his dad and says, where's the lamb? We've got the wood, we've got the fire, we've got the altar, where's the lamb? And Abraham said God will provide himself a lamb and he surrendered himself to the fact that he was going to offer his son a sacrifice to the Lord. Did the Lord really want Abraham to kill Isaac? No, but he wanted to know that he was surrendered to him. He wanted to know that he would give everything, even his son. And you know, in, in Abraham's heart of hearts, he knew that Isaac was going to be the one that was going to be heir and was going to be the one that was going to be the blessing. And he said, we're told in Hebrews, Abraham realized that God was all powerful and he could raise him again from the dead if he wanted to. And so he's going to offer him. God had to pull him up and say, Abraham, Abraham, sacrifice not the child, not, don't hurt him. And then they found the ram and they offered the ram in his place. It's a beautiful picture of what God has done for us in replacing us and sacrificing his son, the lamb of God, for us on the cross. Beautiful picture. And so we see that that is true worship. In Daniel, a different word is used. And it means to prostrate oneself and fall down. And when Daniel worshipped God, where did he do that? On his knees. On his knees. Worship God. But you know what? In the New Testament, it, it also has that idea of um, uh, fawning and crouching down. And in one of the meanings, it says uh, to kiss like a dog licking his master's hand. You know, like a dog is basically truly devoted to the master and licks the hand of the master, comes up and, you know, basically is saying, I'm surrendered to you. I reminded of the chooks in our backyard. If I walk into the backyard, sometimes they'll just crouch down. And that's what we need to be with God. We need to be surrendered, truly uh, devoted to him. And, and this is when we come together to, to reverence him. That word is first found in Matthew chapter 22. Uh, sorry, Matthew chapter 2 and verse 2. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 2. When the wise men came, and they, they came to Herod, and in verse 2 saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him they came bearing gifts and they were going these guys were important guys in the courts of their king and yet they have come all the way from their homeland and traveled all the way to uh, Bethlehem or probably to Jerusalem to talk to the king first but they came there and were willing to go anywhere to find him so that they could bow down and worship him to crouch down to pay homage to prostrate themselves before the lord true worship at the temptation of jesus christ when satan was to, uh, was 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 tempting the lord in answer jesus said unto him get thee hence satan for it is written Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou 
serve. And it's interesting that worship and service come together. They do, they come together. The woman at the well, when the Lord Jesus Christ was revealing himself to her, uh, said, Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. Ye know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such as to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We must need to be worshipping the Lord as a group. And you know what? We can worship the Lord on our own. We can humble ourselves and, and, and be prostrate. But you know what? So much more when we do it together. How much better. You know, the Lord's table. What a time of worship. And really our hearts must be really knelt down and prostrated before the Lord when we come to partake of the Lord's table because that truly is a humbling experience that God, Almighty God, the Creator God, sent His Son to die for us on the cross. And that's what we come to remember. That Jesus died for us and shed his blood and rose again from the dead. What a blessing that is. And so we have this wonderful blessing that Jesus Christ has come so that we can worship him in spirit and in truth. Him only shall thou serve. We looked in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 10. And that word serve there uh, is a type of worship. And I did mention that service and worship come hand in hand. There is sacrifice oftentimes with worship. There is sacrifice with service. Turn with me to Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. It's a verse of scripture that I've been working through and trying to memorise this passage of scripture. I won't pain you by trying to quote it now. But the word of God says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We need to be willing to sacrifice our pride. We need to humble ourselves before God. We need to be worshipping. We need to be on our knees uh, Worshipping him, even if it's just our hearts bowing to him because he is almighty God. The fourth function of the church is the salvation of souls and the worldwide proclamation of God's saving grace expressed in the shed blood and finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ and his death on Calvary and his resurrection and ascension. That's preaching the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 15, the Apostle Paul talking to the Corinthian church puts in a nutshell what the gospel is and what we should be preaching, what we should be telling people. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you which also ye have received and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the to the scriptures. There's the gospel in a nutshell. And Jesus Christ, when he was on earth, 
in Mark chapter 16 and verse 15, after his resurrection, he said, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, every person. That's what it's talking about. Every person. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. You know, we are to preach the gospel. You know, God, we need to be with them and encourage them. And it doesn't just stop with preaching the gospel because we've already talked about edifying the believers. We want to make sure that, you know, God, through his word and being able to minister to those things, that God can then do a bit of weeding because we don't want them that seed amongst the, the thorns. God needs to do some weeding sometimes in our lives, the cares of this world. Amen. Sometimes it needs to pull out a few rocks so that the soil is deeper, so that that seed can get down into good soil. Amen. A bit of farming for you, a bit of weeding and a good rock picker. Amen. That's what I need at the school at the moment, is a rock picker. I've got about half a dozen. They're called kids. But anyway, we won't go there. All right. But the thing is that we need to preach the gospel and then we need to be edifying them and encouraging them and discipling them and, and strengthening them so they don't just wander off into the world. We need to be a blessing to them, teaching them, enlisting them as learners is what we need to be doing. Preach the gospel. That is the purpose of the church and we need to be encouraging one another. Now, if I'm getting slack, you know, you need to tell me. And we need to do that with each other. It's something that needs to keep on going. We need to be keep on getting out the word of God. What a blessing it was to get all those tracks out and the reaction that there was. Thumbs up, thumbs down, you know. Um, but you know what? The gospel is going to do that. It's going to please some and it's going to upset somebody. But you know what? It's affecting them in one way. They, what they do with that gospel, God, they're going to have to stand before God in that. Not only do we need to get the gospel out and we could go to lots of other verses of scripture, but we also need to defend the faith. The Constitution says... Function of the church is the defense of the faith which was once delivered to the saints until he comes. We need to defend the faith. We need to be steadfast, unmovable, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Now, a lot of changes have been happening and we need to make sure that if we change, it's because of God's word. Now, John... Uh, Dan changed the order of service this morning. It's just preference. It's not doctrine. It means nothing. It might have even been better. Praise God. Hey? Talk to you about no. I know. <laughs> but you know what? I've done it too. You know what? We had the Lord's Supper at the end of the sermon one time. People were going, oh, he's gone crazy. He's forgotten. But I taught on the Lord's table in the sermon and then we had it after the sermon. Preference. It's not doctrine. But when it comes to doctrine, we need to stand on it. Amen? We need to stand firm, be unmovable. What does it say in Jude? Let's turn to Jude right at the end. Second last book of the Bible. And Jude... Verses 3 and 4, it says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, 
turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. We need to contend for the faith. We need to stand up for the word of God. Amen. And, and you will be blessed when you do. When you stand on the word of God, you will be blessed. You will be encouraged. God will fortify you because of it. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 7 says, Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart inasmuch as both in my bonds and in, my, in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye are all partakers of my grace. You see, we need to defend the defense and confirmation of the gospel. It's so important. This is not in our constitution as a function of the church, but I think it should be there. And that is the exercising of spiritual gifts in and through the church. And I think that's so important. Now, I'm not going to go into, uh, at the moment, I'm not going to go into um, uh, the spiritual gifts and the gift, uh, the, the um, uh, sign gifts and all those sorts of things, but we are given gifts at salvation, things that God might even be developing before we're even saved through secular work or whatever it might be. And God knows when we're going to be saved and he can be training in those gifts. Who would have thought that I'll be out the front teaching the word of God? But God had led me down a path that I would actually be in secular teaching. Interesting, isn't it? And then when I was teaching, it was interesting, one of the uh, executives says, I think you should be going down the line of pastoral care. You know what happened then? Warning. Warning, that was what's going on in my head. What's going on here? But God used those even unsaved people to direct me in a way and direct me into a place where I need to be in the church. Even though I was fighting it all the way, kicking and screaming. But God led me down that track. And I praise God for that. So each one that is saved is, is given gifts used in the church and of the church. Turn with me to the book of Romans. Here's one list of gifts. Romans chapter 12. And we read this morning already verses 1 and 2. But let's start at verse 3. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of, of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now that word soberly means to think like not too humbly and not high. Don't be proud, but don't, you know, be proud and, and be proudly humble. I'm so proud that I'm humble sort of thing. We, we need to be thinking soberly, rightly, as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. That's every believer, man and woman. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given unto us, whether Prophecy, let us prophesy according to the portion of faith. Of ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching. He that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him, give, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. There's a list of gifts. 
that are sometimes really overlooked. Amen? Are you an exhorter? Are you a ruler? Are you a giver? Are you one that shows mercy? You know, we should all have those. But that some are gifted to be more. You know what? If we are to give, then God will en- enable you to give. That's what your gift is. If you are one that has mercy, then God will enable you to do it with cheerfulness. If you are a minister, that doesn't mean a pastor. That's a servant ministering to people. God will allow you to minister in that way. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Romans 12, and it's interesting they line up sometimes with different things with Corinthians and, and Romans, but Corinthians 12, it talks about the different gifts. At the end of the chapter, it talks about the, the body not being all, of, all a foot or all a hand or whatever it might be, or all nigh, all a nose. Verse 28, and God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondly prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Now it's interesting, most people if they want a gift, they're going to center on something that is out the front. But what about that one there? Helps. There's a gift. What about governments? There's a gift. We need to be uh, aware that there are other gifts other than these uh, sign gifts. And like I said, I will probably preach at some stage on those. Uh, and uh, about tongues and about healings. Can God heal? Amen. Can. And we should be praying for healing. Can God enable someone to learn a language? Amen. And some people really are able to learn a language, like very easily. And we've got people in this church in three, four, five languages. Praise God for them. And fluently, some of them. No, but God can do those things. But the emphasis on the sign gifts, I don't think that's, that's the way to go. I think we should be emphasising on all and looking at the fact that God has given gifts to different ones so that they can be leaders in the church, so that they can be uh, uh, helpers, preaching the word of God, doing government, all that sort of administration, helps. Hospitality, there's another one. Peter says it in 1 Peter 4, 9, use hospitali- hospitality one with another without grudging. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Use the gift that God has given you. And why should we use it? It's for the benefit of of others in the church and it's for the benefit of the spread of the gospel it's for the benefit of the edification of the saints all these things first peter 4 9 says uh and i've already read that it says use hospitality one or another without grudging as every man hath received the gift even so minister the same one to another it's for the benefit of others in the church Galatians 5, 13 and 14. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. You know, I was 
You know, we get confronted sometimes by Scripture. If God has given us a gift, we need to use it to minister to others. If God has called you into a place of ministry, we need to be serving one another in love. How are we serving one another? Or are we self-serving? This is a question, isn't it? You know, we can use those gifts as self-serving. And it really made me think this morning as I was going over this message. Are we really trying to serve one another or are we just self-serving? And it's a good question. And so the function of the church is many. The function of the church is to, uh, first of all, to have fellowship. Secondly, we need to be uh, uh, edifying one another in the word of God. We need to be worshipping together and encouraging each other to worship. We need to be witnessing and getting the gospel message out, the salvation of souls and enlisting them as learners. We need to defend the faith. We need to stand up for the word of God. We need to use our gifts in service to other people for their benefit and for the furtherance of the gospel and the church and for its proper functioning. You know, if my arm and hands are not functioning with the body, then I'm not going to lift food to my mouth because it's going to rebel. Let's, let's, let's rebel, hand. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to pick things up. I'm not going to move things out of the road and, uh, you know, so you can bump into things or whatever it might be. A hand could rebel, couldn't it? No, it couldn't. But if it did, it wasn't doing the right thing, it wasn't serving the rest of the body, then you don't feed yourself. And what's, it, what's going to happen? The whole body is affected. And so we need to realise this. Oh, your eyes are not sending messages back, so you can't... You know, when a person's blind, you know, it, it's difficult because you're going to bump into things, especially if someone's mean and moves the furniture in your house. That, that's another story. But the thing with it is that, you know, we need to have each part of the body working together, serving one another in love so that we function properly. Let's pray. Our loving God, Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your word. We thank you and praise you that you explain and express and show that the church is like a body. And Lord, we thank you and praise you that uh, this local assembly has been given different ones that serve in different capacities. And Lord, take their responsibility seriously. Lord, I pray that we would all look at serving one another in love and trying to be a blessing to each one uh, in some way. Lord, I pray that you would help us and encourage us to exercise our gifts in the church. And, uh, Lord, not to be afraid to be a blessing to other people. And so, Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for uh, this day. We thank you and praise you for the church. In Jesus' most precious and worthy name. Amen.